Uh, my name's Tash. Um, I'm the social media editor of the iPaper, um, and I've worked basically in most areas of news uh, since I left uni uh, quite a few years ago. So, been a video reporter, um, been a content editor, and a news reporter largely. And actually, I think it's my kind of love for news and being a news reporter that's made me kind of want to bring that over to social media and make kind of social media a really kind of effective place for promoting those news stories that maybe now get overlooked because not everyone's picking up a paper anymore and and those stories that I used to spend weeks on covering and, and then suddenly they wouldn't do well on the Facebook page so they didn't matter anymore but actually I don't really see that as something that should be the case um, and I think Instagram is a really great place uh, for journalists themselves and also um, social media editors within those organisations to really promote those stories that maybe um, won't, won't surface as much as they used to. Um, so great, thank you so much for coming. Um, so what will this masterclass cover? So it's kind of going to cover a bit of everything. Um, so whether you're a digital journalist or a social media editor, being able to repurpose or adapt um, kind of content to fit across multiple platforms is so important. Um, and so I wanted to kind of cover all of those areas within this. So we'll look at creating and repurposing news content and what that means. Um, tools that are available within Instagram for creating content, um, tools that are available for publishing that content. So uh, if you're just publishing yourself or like me when you're managing multiple platforms, um, what's the quickest and easiest way to do that? We'll also take a look at kind of building an audience, how you do that, where audience strategy kind of comes in. It's kind of those words that are kind of said by social media editors and everyone else in the newsroom goes, oh, I don't know what that means. I'm just going to ignore it. Um, so we'll have a little look at that and how you build the right audience as well. Um, and then also look at news gathering and how you can source news through Instagram as well. Um, and then a bit about personal promotion. Uh, what I will say is this will all be from my own experience, um, how other newsrooms are using it at the moment um, and how maybe they should or could use it in the future or even how they could be doing it now. Um, I know I wish I had an endless team and endless amounts of time to put inst into Instagram, um, but it's just not the case. So it's kind of everything I'm saying I would love to do, but I know I don't do, but it's just what is kind of out there. Um, also, it will be quite newsy. As I've said, I've come from a news background um, and so this is going to be quite newsy because I'm quite newsy. Um, but the tips, I think, are kind of transferable across kind of any topic. So if you're covering kind of sport, lifestyle, culture, anything like that, or even outside of journalism, maybe, um, I think it can still apply and it's still tools that will be useful to you. Why use Instagram for news? So as Ian said, the uh, Reuters Digital News Report of 2020 said that kind of across all age groups, Instagram has doubled um, since 2018, which is huge. Um, and it's also predicted to overtake Twitter, which I'm 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 such an Instagram fan and probably less so for Twitter. So this makes me so happy. Um, and it's kind of what I've been saying for about three years to my bosses is that Instagram's coming like Twitter is not going to be as important, um, but it's still very uh, journocentric on Twitter. And I think, um, as Ian said, it's going to be kind of a hard pill to swallow for some people uh, that maybe they need to transfer their attentions across. Um, but yeah, so Instagram is just another potential area really for growing an online audience, generating website click throughs, which of course is important when you're working for a news organisation, actually getting those referrals back to the site so you know people are actually reading the content. Um, and then also reach that new generation of readers, which I think is so important, especially um in terms of hitting that next generation that is so different from that kind of generation Z. I I hate talking in generational terms but it's it does make it a lot easier and um, to kind of round it up but that, reaching that generation Z that are so different from us millennials and then the the generation above us as well um and actually it's become a lot harder for newspapers to hit that next generation and, and social media especially Instagram offers offers that tool to hit that next generation 
Um, so another reason Instagram is great for news is it's basically a creative hub that allows you to display and adapt your own journalistic work or that of your colleagues in multiple different ways, um, from just using pictures, sorry, to producing long form video. Um, and as I've said, whether you're a solo social media editor like me or you've got a full social team, uh, repurposing content from other areas of the newsroom is key to making the most of your time um, and the social media, making the most of the social media that you manage. Um, so, for example, I've, I've got some stuff here. So this will be a um, slight promotion for the iPaper um, all the way through this, because why wouldn't I? And that's what I do for my job. Um, so we've got two pieces here. One of them, we had Madeline, our environment reporter. She did a piece about the uh, new cycle routes through London that were being unveiled during the pandemic. Um, and she went out and did a video of this of her just cycling around London. It was a really great video. She did a like, nice little head cam on and made a video for that. And we decided that that would work well for us as a video on our Instagram. And it did really well. That was already, ex it, already existed, it was already out there, it had already been made and it was just something I was like right it's already there, I'm repurposing that content and I'm sticking it on our, on our Instagram. It needed a slight re-edit so that's where the adaption comes in so we have to slightly re-edit it, put a different kind of crop on it and then it was good to go so that kind of that's a good example of that repurpose and adapt that I do as a social media editor and that Instagram allows you to do as well. So another one here um, was back in July uh, when the no DSS bans on housing benefits um, uh, tenants was ruled that big court ruling came in. And it's quite a mouthful that not a lot of people knew what that meant um, but actually our reporter Jazz here had done a lot of work into that piece and then also there was a lot of campaigning from actually one of our housing correspondents um, called Vic Vicky Spratt and so what I did I got Vicky to jump on our um, Instagram story series I explained and she broke that down really and it's quite a heavy topic and you're talking about stats about people that have been um, refused tenancy agreements, um, what new, no DSS actually means, all of this. It's quite clunky, um, clunky text and data but actually breaking it down in stories as you can see I did it in quite a few on there um, and that was straight to camera and, and that did really well and again that's repurposing the content that's out there and then adapting that to fit the platform. So posting for news. So how do you post on a news account? Let's take a look. So first of all, this is a little look at the iPaper. So as Ian said, I started there last year and in that time, so just over a year, I doubled our audience. So we went from when I started, we had around 4,000 followers. Um, no one had posted in a while. They were all a bit like, no one really knew what they were doing. There was no kind of sense of direction. And I saw it really as a blank canvas to come in and just completely transform it. Um, and also come in and, and put my own spin on it and things that maybe I learned when I was at Metro that didn't work there. And I thought, OK, this is this is something that can be applied to the iPaper. Also, the fact that the iPaper also has a print product. Um, I really like looking at Instagram as if it's kind of a, a new front page or a, a, the flat plan of a newspaper. And it's kind of you want to be able to see that same style on an Instagram page as if you were just opening the paper up, which I kind of feel like I try to do um, on our Instagram page. Every morning I come in, I'll read the paper, I'll see what pictures have been put in. And those are usually the first ones that I'll say, right, those are the ones that are going to go on our Instagram page today. It may also be our our um, brand itself is known for it's like your daily briefing, news in brief, that's very much the eye paper. And actually those little nibs that you'll see in the, in the paper that may not even make it onto the website as a full story, um, they will be a singular Instagram post that I will put up. So you can see a couple of examples here. Um, we also are lucky enough to have our own cartoonist. So we have Ben Jennings who does stuff for us. And that was one of the main things when I started. I was like, I, we need to get these cartoons up and they do so well for us now, which is really great. Um, so three of the main things I focused on in my strategy for doubling the pages account and um, following was consistency. Um, so this was done with regular posting. It's not necessarily how much you post, it's just kind of being consistent with that posting, making sure you're um, 
getting things up on a regular basis and, and just having that volume there. You don't need to be posting every hour. You don't need to be posting on the hour every two hours or it, there's not a strict time. It, it's just putting up when as and when you can, which for me is great because I'm obviously by myself and doing this <laughs> alongside other things. Um, but also it means that unlike Facebook, it's not as regimented and because of the feed algorithm, you might post something and six hours later it doesn't actually get into most of your followers feeds until then. Um, so actually, so it's just that regularity of it. Um, also, as I've said, that recognisable style on feed posts and also within our Instagram stories as well. Um, so I always use the same font. Uh, so it's literally as granular as font. So I always use the same font on our news posts. That is the font for the iPaper that you will see on our front page. Um, if I ever use our sub font, which is the next one down in kind of um, importance, uh, that's what I would do on a, like a side post or a sub post on there. Um, and then also having a strong eye voice with the stories we post. So I use copy from the um, stories and the captions and make sure each post is an essential briefing within itself. The paper is your daily essential briefing. And I wanted to make sure each of our Instagram posts did that as well. So, Looking in general at the types of posts that are out there, we have uh, feed posts, which I slightly covered then. Uh, so that's what you see in the grid. These are posts from the Telegraph. So that's a little snapshot of the Telegraph's feed there. Um, I love the Telegraph's feed. They, they have the dream of a social team. I think they have about six people. And I'm just like, I would love that. Um, and that's another example of, of a newspaper making it look like a newspaper flat plan on their grid. I love it. Uh, then we've got stories. So that's what appears at the top. Um, and so there's one from BBC News there with a story about Trump. So and there's also a see more link on there where you can swipe up and read that story. You've got IGTV, which is a long form video. Um, this is normally preferably by Instagram posted in like portrait format, but you can get away with that. There is a cheat around that, but I will come to you later. Um, then you've got the new arrival. You've got Reels, which seems familiar. I'm not sure where I've seen Reels before. Um, and that's kind of picking up. It's not really found its feet yet. No one's really that keen on it. Everyone's just stealing all their stuff from the other platform. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and just putting them on there. And then we've also got the private messaging or the DMs as well, um, which has evolved dramatically alongside it. And that's now you can do video calls within there. You can send pictures, you can send videos. Um, I think there's new features coming where you can watch things. It's all changing, but you know, like Instagram is 10 years old now and it's stayed relevant this long because it has adapted um, like good digital journalists do. And it's adapted by building its own ideas, but also, you know, getting a little bit of help along the way. Oh yeah, TikTok, that's what Reels reminds me of, yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously, so the feed posts, it's very much that kind of meme format now that does well, that kind of text and pictures um, that originates from Reddit and your Facebook feeds, um, stories, obviously, from Snapchat. Um, and then uh, Instagram TV, kind of comes from YouTube. It's that long form video. They could see it was working for other people. Also Facebook, when Facebook started pushing for more three minute um, length videos, it adopted that. Then we've got Reels, obviously comes from TikTok and TikTok obviously comes from Vine. Um, there might be some people on here who never knew about Vine. It's the original TikTok um, and had a sad demise and us millennials still reminisce about it far too often. Um, and then private messaging, of course, is a lot like WhatsApp and is probably in probably in competition with WhatsApp, I would say. So let's look at these different feed posts in a bit more detail and in doing so, look at the kind of things that you could do if you were in charge of a platform and you had access to stories um, on a, a, web, a news website and how you can put those up out there. So we've got feed. Um, so we'll go through the feed posts. So feed posts are still the bread and butter of Instagram, really. They're like the main, the main thing, the main thing you see, the main thing you scroll through. Um, it's where you save all your good pictures for and that's where you post them. Like you wouldn't, I know people put stuff in their stories, but you wouldn't necessarily put that on your feed. Um, and 
it has changed a lot. There was kind of an obsession around the mid like 2010s, like 2013 to 2016, where you had to have the most perfect grid. And I I think I put all of my pictures on like a white background so it looked completely uniform. That is now dead. Nobody wants a perfect grid anymore. You can absolutely change it up. No one checks your grid. Make it the ugliest grid you've ever seen and you're doing Instagram right. Um, so, but photography still does really well on Instagram. It started as a photo sharing platform and that still does really well. People can't help it. They can't help liking nice pictures of places. Um, so we've got some examples here. So there's uh, BBC News, uh, Manchester Evening News here, um, and also The Independent uh, with one of the princess's weddings. I've completely forgotten her name, but we'll carry on. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's just that kind of pretty picture thing. They're usually scenic or capture a moment or event that's recognisable, um, that's being covered in the news anyway. Then we have news posts. So uh, some examples here. This is one I did for the iPaper. We had, it was basically a copy of our front page that we had that day um, after the explosion in Beirut. Um, these incredible, like harrowing pictures from Beirut that you just can't, you can't even imagine. And just like, you can stare at them for so long and you just can't look away. And that, the headline we had that day was so striking. I was just like, right, we've got to put it on Instagram. And it, it did resonate a lot among our audience um, as well. Um, and so it, news posts very much have um, strong images, but then also headlines to explain it a bit more, maybe further text in the caption. It could also be um, quote a, a strong quote. Um, so we've got one here from uh, Metro, and that's kind of like a little mini social headline about this girl that was made prime minister for the day. Um, and there's one here from The Telegraph that's obviously an opinion piece um, with a bit more detail. And actually, it's quite a lot of text there but it still does work. Um, however, not all news posts have to have text on the actual pictures themselves. A lot of news organisations literally just have pictures on their feeds. Um, so the sun and the mirror, very similar layout there. Um, we've got Molly May there, we've got Boris, we've got the uh, Black Lives Matter statue that was put up in Bristol. Um, and there's no text on these, but then within the captions of those posts, they then kind of break it down a bit more, give a bit more um, detail, um, and then we'll usually say link in our bio. I'll come back to links and, and that sort of thing in a bit. Um, but yeah, so then we've got one minute video. This is another thing that kind of kind of can appear on your feed. Um, so these are actual moving things but you can't see that because it's in my presentation um but so this first one here from channel 4 news is a graphic that shows the um antarctic ice melting pretty depressing but really effective looks great um and just then loops on your feed as you're scrolling through um this one here from the economist it's actually a clip from one of their podcasts so just showing that actually it doesn't have to be a 60 second um cut of a longer video for your feed it can be just any form of media so uh yeah so that was a, a clip from one of their podcasts and then within the caption for that it kind of broke down the topic of what the podcast was about where you can listen to it um you can also we played around with this a bit when i was at metro and putting captions over the top of it so you can kind of listen and watch along at the same time um and it is really good for getting new listeners listeners into podcasts and things like that then this one here from the Daily Mail, this is an absolute cheap one, this. So it's the story we're all obsessed with at the moment about Dominic West and Lily James and then obviously him turning up outside his house with his wife and giving her a kiss, very odd. Um, sorry, Dominic, if you're on this call. Um, and what actually um, they've done here, so it just looks like a photo collage. But what they've done is they've made it into um, a video post. Let me just see if I can share this across. Um, so, can you see that, Ian? Can I get a nod? Yeah. What, what am I? What am I looking at? Can you see the Instagram post here on the screen? The, the Economist one. Uh, maybe. Oh, no, it's, it hasn't moved forward, um, Tash. So maybe you need to reshare. Can you still see the presentation? Yeah, feed posts, okay. one one minute video. 
Okay, I'll leave it on that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. But basically what they've done on this one is actually it's a video on this Daily Mail one, but all it does, it makes that exclusive banner like flash. So it's a still image with basically a looped flashing kind of GIF on it, um, which actually mean, means it probably it then racks up views, which means they get more reach and it means they've got like viewers watching it, which means they'll get more engagement. It's very sneaky, um, but very effective. OK, so another version of feed post is the PowerPoint, which is my absolute favourite. I am a bit obsessed with this, to be honest. Um, and there is a really good Washington Post article about this that I can include later on. Um, so the PowerPoint, basically, which is the name that I've lifted from this Washington Post piece. Um, so in 2017, Instagram added the ability to upload more than one picture to your feed, and that became that kind of carousel image. Um, but in the last year or so, there's been the arrival of this like PowerPoint format, um, which has dramatically increased in popularity kind of with the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as charities and news organisations jumping on this to kind of dispel misinformation about coronavirus. It's that it's that that post that you see all your friends sharing in their stories uh, where you can just tap through and it, it is like a mini presentation in itself and um, so we've got one here so and it's actually itself spawned accounts that now have millions of followers so this so you want to talk about account uh, which I'm sure many people follow um, there's one here obviously you want to talk about fracking that then breaks that down in quite a few posts uh, one here, um, things not to say to a black woman. Um, that was something that was very, very prevalent and still is. And I'm still very keen to kind of share those and, and put those out there and and really just just hitting home and, and also getting into the feeds of people that maybe they wouldn't normally get into, which is really good to see. Um, and then this final one here, um, actually shared by one of the columnists at the iPaper and many other people when there was that um, black and white selfie craze that went around and everyone was just like, oh, I get to take a picture of myself in black and white and share it. And no one actually cared or bothered to check and see that it was actually about um, domestic violence in Turkey. Um, and so this was then shared and that became kind of more prevalent in itself. So it's very much a fake news era um, method, <laughs> I think, within social media. Um, and it's one, I think, news organisations would be wise to jump on um, and break down things like that. Uh, so metro.co.uk recently did one about mental health um, and uh, what you can do to kind of de-stress during kind of coronavirus times and things like that. Um, so they, they can be lighthearted as well. Um, I clicked on one the other day that was uh, uh, the best way to stalk someone and I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. And it was like, tap through and then it was like go for a long walk put your phone down go for a long walk so they're there to catch you out as well um but yeah that's i i'm really into those and would love to know your thoughts on those as well um if you've used them yourselves if you've seen um ones that stood out to you um how you can see those kind of progressing in future as well be interesting to know and then finally for the types of feed posts that are out there we've got just plain old text so um, these are some examples from an account called Simple Politics, which are absolutely kind of dominating this area. So text is just really hard to get out there on Instagram. It's not a text platform. It's a it's a picture sharing platform. Um, but Simple Politics is doing it really well. And they're kind of owning that market really in, in the UK at the moment in terms of breaking down complex issues and, and just getting them out there in a very simple and digestible way. Um, so here's some examples. So from today, they had like the headlines oh no yesterday sorry today is Wednesday um had some headlines from the papers and had those in there then we've got some of the charts from um the scientists announcements and then what they'll do as well is um they were really good during uh, the main kind of lot of Brexit talks last year because they they break down what is the Brexit bill what is in it what will be discussed in parliament today um rather than just you being constantly told so and so said this in another round of these committees it was really good at just breaking it down in a very granular way um i le i definitely learned a lot from re reading on there as well so yeah that's a good one i would give them a follow if you're into politics and and if you're not as well give them a follow because you'll probably learn something um so captions so with news posts when putting those up um captions can be there to kind of 
give context and explain what you want to talk about. There is this assumption that Instagram is only a place for like positive news um, and people don't want to be there to read things. But honestly, if people, if your audience is there and they're interested in that topic, then they will click on those posts and they will read and then hopefully click through to the link if they've got that there. Um, and also going back to that Reuters um, report, it was it said on there that a quarter of 18 to 24 year olds actually use Instagram as a source of news. So if that's the case and we want to reach that next kind of generation of readers, we need to be giving them the news. We need to be bringing the news to them. It's not up to us to wait for them to come to us, really, like just come to the website because that's not what they're doing as it's been pointed out they are going to Instagram to find that news so we need to be giving that to them there. So an example here we had this piece uh, from September um, about the crackdown on groups um, and within that I then did these bullet points that kind of broke it down a bit more um, and that was liked by quite a few people which was really good to see as just a politics post like our audience are very politically minded anyway um but they do still like to like pictures of cats which is really annoying um but they did really engage with this which was good to see um and then also hashtags hashtags are important as well this will um help you attract new followers and make sure that you're hitting the right audience for that topic so uh, what I would say about hashtags, so you can put these kind of anywhere on your post, really anywhere within the caption. I always tend to put them at the end. Um, so I'd say use relevant hashtags and try and go for the most popular ones. Um, use more than three and a maximum of 10. So kind of that golden, that golden number of hashtags is probably about six or seven. And um, you actually you don't need to use a million. There was a time probably about five years ago where you used to do about 100 a post and it was just too much. Um, and then you can actually build your own hashtag with consistent use. So uh, I did this while I was at Metro. Uh, we built up the hashtag Metro LDN um, hashtag, which now has 70,000 posts on it. It's very much, it's not news focus, it's about pretty pictures of London, um, but that did help build the audience of the Metro account. Um, and yeah, as I said, in three years, that's now got 70,000 uh, posts on it, which is great. I started doing that when I started at the iPaper. Um, so using hashtag the iPaper and hashtag iNews, um, and that's now got a few thousand posts under it as well, which is good to see. It just encourages more people to share it. And then if they're sharing something to do with the story they've seen from your paper or your organisation, then they're more likely to use it. Um, and then most importantly, always provide credit to photographers um, because they can come after you for money, um, but also um, mention organisations as well. So like tag them in uh, when you can um, and hopefully then they'll they'll share it themselves as well. Um, so as I was, as I said before, uh, finding the right hashtags to use. So this one, UK politics, always try to go for the one with the most posts underneath it. So you can see here this top one's got 51,000 posts under UK politics. Um, the next one down, UK politics memes, it would depend entirely on the post itself. If, if it's quite a serious post, you obviously don't want to put it up with loads of memes and funny on funny pages and stuff like that. Um, so don't just always go for the most popular ones, go for the ones that are most relevant to your post and your organisation as well. Stories. OK, this is my favourite thing on Instagram, um, which you can probably tell because I'm really happy we're talking about that. Um, so it's now over seven years since Snapchat introduced stories um, and this social media format has now been adapted, adopted, sorry, by most of the social media platforms out there. So it's kind of appearing on everything and everyone loves it. Everyone uses it. Um, and if you don't use it, then you definitely watch other people's. Um, so don't tell me you don't like it. Um, <laughs> there might not be one social media platform for everyone, but there are kind of universal formats that obviously work. Um, so it's a great place to host images and video. And as the name suggests, it's a great place for storytellers. And ultimately, journalists, we are storytellers and it's a great place to put your content. Um, the 24 hour limit allows it to stay relevant and it gives a real time feel to the audience's involvement um, as well as making quite like heavy content feel a bit more digestible. They can tap off it if they don't want to watch anymore. They can skip ahead. They've got the power. Basically, you're giving you're just giving them the content in an easy way to go through. Um, 
and I think that's people respond quite well to that. Um, if you're creating content for stories, don't be afraid to get in front of the camera yourself um, or other members of the newsroom, roping your colleagues as well. Be a kind of Generation Z, that Snapchat generation that have always grown up, always having Snapchat since having a phone. Um, they kind of look for front, front facing presenting um, and Instagram a couple of years ago started this really big push that their, their new kind of focus on kind of creators and news organisations was making this authentic content and, and that front facing content is what Instagram views as authentic and what they see that, that younger generation as being authentic. Um, so if you're producing uh, content like this you could include experts or specialist journalists so on the right hand side here um, you've got a couple of screenshots I've really not captured their best sides bless them um, but from our um, uh, I explain series on our Instagram so we've got Chloe on the left and um, she's our politics reporter um, and she often breaks down kind of political updates and news for us um, just because she already has that innate knowledge like we script these obviously and, and kind of structure them but if there's anything she thinks of off the cuff she'll be able to talk it through um then we've got Rachira here as well who is one of our staff writers but she focuses on um disinformation and social media reporting um and so this piece she was talking about fake news spreading um about coronavirus um and again that was kind of i've given them a little caption there a flag that they have that specialist knowledge um, and that they're, they're there for the audience to tell them about it, which is really important. Um, and then also another aspect of that is having recurring presenters, um, which just builds recognition. Um, it adds kind of a face to a brand. People are so used to seeing like their friends on Instagram, having that kind of recognisable person that always kind of reappears um, will ultimately kind of lead them to be recognisable and be like, oh yeah, oh, I watched her last time. She was really interesting. I'll click on that. Um, and oh, sorry, and I do do that. Chloe and Ratira are probably the, the most frequent within my I Explain series just because they're quite good at it. They enjoy it. They're willing. Um, and it does mean that they kind of build that recognition amongst our audience as well. So stories and the length of them. I couldn't do this without having a cat gif in it. I'm very sorry. Um, so it's your first time doing stories on a personal page or on a, a page that's a main page for a news account. Um, try not to overwhelm your audience. Uh, if you upload a stories episode and it's like 25 taps long, people are going to be like, no, I'm not. Who are these people? I've never watched them before. Why should I give them my time? Um, so you don't want to overwhelm them. Um, the first when we didn't start doing our I Explain series until this year, um, a year after we'd we'd first started doing stories and I'd even I'd post three and we'd get people like clicking off within the first one. So you just need to like build it up. Um, what you want to do is you want to create a habit amongst your viewers. Um, so yes, yeah, so starting off by posting like 30 at once, that's going to be a chore. They don't know you. They don't have any loyalty towards you. You want to just build that up. So every every day, if you're posting every day, like do one or two and then and then space it out or, or preview something and prepare them to so say, OK, coming this Wednesday, we've got a new episode of this. Don't miss out. And then it's not a shock to suddenly see 25 stories and for them to be like, oh, I don't have time to watch that. And I actually don't care because you don't want that. You want to build it up gradually. Um, so once you've posted these stories um, and you're in your account, you can swipe up and you are able to see who, how many people have watched your stories um, and who those people are. Uh, you can do this on your own personal Instagrams. I'm sure you've, most of you already know that, but when you post a story, if you swipe up, you can see how many people have viewed it and who those uh, people are, how many of your ex-boyfriends are watching, how many of your ex-girlfriends are watching. You can see it all, oh, it's great. Um, you can also see how many people have interacted with it. So if you've got a sticker in there, if you've got a link, you can see who's tapped through, who's clicked on somebody's mention. Um, you can also see the people that have tapped forward, tapped back, maybe held down and watched it a little longer. Um, so it is, it's really good for having that data there and, and stories, it's very like, uh, very instant reaction and um, you're able to see kind of instantly how well it's doing basically. Um, so yeah, as I said, don't be disheartened if your first few posts 
uh, don't have many people tapping through, they need to get used to you. Um, and yeah, try not to overwhelm them. Oh, and consistency is key as well. So that goes back to um, what I was saying about my plan for the, when I um, grew the iPapers account. So consistency, that kind of consistent posting, make sure they remember you. We want to make that a habit. So tools in stories, what do you have available to you? So on the right hand side here, this is what you can see when you're posting on stories. Um, there's a variety of different things there. I would say have a go with all of them, even if, if it's just on your personal one, just have a play and just see what works and what doesn't for you. Uh, what you find the most cringe and what you find the least cringe, basically. Um, mix up pictures, text and video to put together a com comprehensive story packages. Um, you can save down images at different stages of production uh, to stack one after the other. I'm sure you've seen this where you've just been um, watching a story and tapping through and it seems like the same image, but then text is being added or pictures are being added. Um, and that's literally probably somebody has created a very busy um, story on their phones and then they've just saved it down, deleted one as aspect, saved it down, deleted the next one, saved it down, deleted to then um, re-upload them all again <laughs> and then that's what makes makes you able to tap through and um, that's a really good viewer experience because it gives the viewer the chance to build that story and um, they may not always stick around they may speedily tap through all the way to the end um, but it does kind of give that if they are genuinely interested in that topic it gives them the opportunity to kind of be part of it and and just one of the other really good things about stories is it's very interactive um, so yes, yeah, so and make the most of the wid widgets you have within Instagram. So there's a few of them on the right hand side there. You've got location, mentions, hashtags, uh, music polls, uh, questions, countdown, ratings, quiz. There's so many that you can do. There's also different ones within the create section of stories itself rather than just doing an upload. Um, so yeah, honestly, just have a sit down, have a playthrough and, and see what you like and don't like. It's a lot of it is personal preference as well. Um, so one of the examples that's quite important, so location is quite an important one for stories. Um, so once you've tagged in a location, you may actually then appear in Discover for people within that location, um, which is really good for picking up audiences audiences is around a specific topic, if it's in a specific area. Um, you could also feature on that local stories, um, local locations story. So there might be like a Manchester um, story or like a Newcastle local story and you could appear on that. Um, I'm sure sometimes that's probably happened to you accidentally, like you've been out uh, at a Christmas market or something like that and you've tagged in where you are and then suddenly you're on the local story and there's 600 people have seen your story that you don't even know who they are but that's why you should have a private account <laughs> um so then you've also got uh hashtags as well which are really important too for kind of reaching that other audience as uh people can follow hashtags as well as locations and so that might surface your story to them as well um, and then mentions too. So this is another thing that I used in terms of growing the iPapers account. So a lot of our columnists are quite like well known. They've quite got quite big social media followings. Um, and I'd make sure I'd, I would share their pieces on our stories um, just so they would then share them across to their pages and their few like our few thousand followers would then hit their kind of tens of thousands of followers um, and we'd happen to like get some more followers from them which is really good so it's always worth mentioning people so if you're doing it from a main account like I was with mentioning journalists or um if you're you could then mention like organizations like charities are always quite good at sharing when you've mentioned them for stories and things like that um then other tools you have um You've also got uh, IG Live, which has again become more popular this year with our within our lockdown lives. Um, and so we've seen a lot of influencers kind of going live to just talk directly to their followers. People like to have that interaction and really getting those fans kind of front and centre. Um, in terms of 
doing this as a journalist, you could go live with another account and do maybe like a bit of a panel discussion or even just do a live interview. If you're planning to interview someone and you think you'll get quite a good like patter with them and it will be an interesting and engaging watch, then, then do that live. You can kind of pre-plan a bit, um, but it will make kind of your followers then a live audience and you could make that a recurring thing. So that could be really interesting. Um, and then announced just last week or the week before was the introduction of the stories location map which sounds familiar again, um, very much like our good friend Snapchat here. Um, so that's kind of just within the archive of your account or the main business account that you're managing. Um, then you can see basically where your stories have been posted. So mine are quite uh, London centric, as you can see. Um, and it's actually, it's probably actually where all our journalists live. <laughs> and where they've all been posting their I explains from. So um, yeah. Cool, so last bit on stories here. This is also another really interesting article um, that I found on Medium by a guy called Eric Feng. I've, I'll send around the link to this as well because it is, it is a really interesting read. If you've got about half an hour to just absolutely geek out on stories and TikTok and Instagram, it's really interesting. Um, so this kind of graph, he made this graph that shows uh, kind of mainstream media, um, I said a format map as he's called it, um, and stories lie smack bang in the middle of this. So um, on the bottom axes, I can never remember which is X and Y, which is why I'm a journalist and not a mathematician. Um, on the simplicity side, so that's on the bottom, you can see kind of the format is hard to make, all the way across to the format is easy to make. And then on the left hand side, we've got storytelling, which is obviously very important to us. Um, so a format can tell kind of not a very good narrative to format can tell a complex narrative. Um, and yeah, stories just sit right in the middle of that. They're simple to make and you can tell a really good story with them. Um, and I, it's just kind of showing that kind of they are the kind of main thing that is transferable across all social media platforms. Um, there's so much you can do with them. There's so much more I would love to do. Um, but yeah, um, it's kind of that he says in it is the perfect compromise of ease of creation and richness of resulting media and narrative. Um, which I really liked. And actually, that's kind of what I strive to achieve when doing our I Explain series. So every episode, I want it to really break down that kind of complex or topic that's a bit kind of much um, and put it in a more interesting and, and uh, interactive way. Um, so what I'll do before then um, is I was going to switch to a different screen. So hopefully I can do this. That's fine, Tash. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to ask people. We've we've got two or three questions coming up. So um, folks, if you want to add your questions into the Q&A um, column on the right hand side uh, while Tash is doing this, we'll um, we'll come to those. We'll come to the first batch of questions maybe in, in five or ten minutes, Tash. Yeah, sounds good. Um, Right, can you see uh, the Daily Mail Instagram post now? And I can see exclusive, there's a little... Um, yeah, so yeah. this is the one I was talking about earlier that I was unable to share. Um, so as you can see, this is the post that they've done uh, that's actually a media post. That So to Instagram, that is a video post they've put in there, but all they've done is basically made this little exclusive ba banner flash uh, by using a GIF or looping a video. Um, it's very clever, it's cheating. Um, I just wanted to jump into uh, one of the episodes of our I Explains just to show kind of all the different features that you can use within um, stories um, and what I try to do when posting and trying to do kind of different things with the different widgets and things like that. Um, so let's do this one. This, so this is me, this is one of my first days back in our office. We're in like one day a week now. Um, and it was kind of it happened to be the same week that everyone was, was debating about whether people should be going back to the office. So, um, so this, we've got our temperature checkers as you go back in, so a bit of like live kind of action footage, um, some talking to camera there with some text over the top. Um, I'm tagged in there as well, which I'll always do with people when they present on these. I've also roped in our SEO editor to film me, uh, which is very interesting. Um, as you can see, not many people in the office there. Um, so again, kind of adding these captions to videos, like video captions are such a key part of social video now. Um, and actually you can do that within 
making a story but kind of just making it a bit more to the point so i'm obviously speaking in full sentences here something like 60 percent of people will listen to stories with the sound on it's not like facebook where i think it's around 30 percent of people will listen with sound on um whereas in instagram around 60 percent will have the sound on so they will listen um but it it, sh it gives you a way of breaking down um the stats like as I've said, we take quite complex um, topics, so we want to be able to break them down in a digestible way. Uh, then we've got a poll, so we ran this poll like in the middle of the episode just to break it up a bit so it's not just constantly my face, um, just to give our audience a bit of a break. Um, it also might help them kind of um, stick around for a bit longer because they might have just been about to tap off and be like, oh, a poll that I can fill out. Uh, which is always fun to do. Um, if we keep going. And then also I used a bit of TikTok magic, um, which obviously we know that Instagram now loves. And those kind of fun transitions are really what kind of um, Reels is about at the moment. It's not really progressed into being kind of more newsy, but I've kind of I incorporated that into our I Explained episode. Look at that transformation great editing um, <laughs> and then we also had another poll here where I was talking about schools reopening oh sorry um, so then and then always we always finish with a swipe up to the original piece normally we'll base um, our I explained episodes around a feature or a few different pieces that have been written across the newsroom and we always want to give credit back to um, our colleagues and who's been working on these so um, yeah so link back to those at the end Great, let me go back to there. Do you want to do any questions, Ian? Yeah, let's 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 do that. Have you reached a natural break? Um, let me do links. OK, and then we can do questions after that. <laughs> yeah, OK, let's let's do that and then we'll have some questions and then we'll do a final half hour and then we'll do some more questions at the end of that. Cool, great. Um, so links, these are another key part of uh, anything really across Instagram, so stories and also in your feed. Um, so see more and um, kind of in our bio links. So with stories, you've got that kind of instant click through, as I just said, that kind of see more. Um, and actually news organisations became largely dependent on link clicks through from Facebook and Twitter. Um, and you can now actually, we don't want to become too dependent on them on Instagram, but it, we're now seeing that kind of pace pick up on how many people are kind of coming through from Instagram. Um, so how do you get people to swipe up, stay away from clickbait, but entice your audience in by using a strong headline or quote. Um, so you want to stay away from things like you'll never believe when that terrifying moment of like that sort of thing. You don't want that click, clickbait is bad. Um, as you just saw in the I explained that I showed, having something that says uh, swipe up to read is really effective in getting people to click through. It's just that little call to action. And actually I find that more people will swipe up with that on the story itself um, than just by having the see more link on there as well. Um, and then also another thing about our I explain series, um, I don't just link out at the end, I'll link out during as well. Um, just because we'll be like covering quite factual information and it might be that there's a separate explainer that we've done that really breaks down that kind of more granular issue um, and I do find that they do have quite high click rates as well so people will click on those and actually then come back which is which is good to see um, and it's also about kind of having that cross promotion and, and promoting the work of our journalists as well. Um, so a quick one with IGTV obviously this is the home for uh, long form video um, and you can also build a collection of videos by adding it to a certain series. So you, there's an example here from metro.co.uk um, and they've got a cocktail series here. So there's one there that's a twice twisted martini. They've got different ones there so you can build kind of a little package there. Um, you can also repurpose social video used on other platforms such as uh, whether it's on the website or on Facebook. Um, you can also house any IG lives you do on there as well. Um, and also these videos don't necessarily have to start their life in portrait format. Um, I'm sure you've seen some other organisations that um, 
put make a portrait background and then overlay it with the video. I think BBC Radio One's quite good for that. Um, and kind of we've used that before. I think it's just making sure that you've got that recognisable background so people know that it's very much your brand, your colours, your fonts. Um, and as long as the content is still high quality and something your audience wants to watch, you can absolutely get away with it. Um, so yeah, as I said, so you use similar branding colours or a logo and then it, it does create that kind of recognisable content collection. Reels, touched on this a little bit. Look how cute that old man is with that dog. So sweet. Um, this is the short form video platform um, and it's only been around for a few months, so it's still finding its feet. Um, and the general consensus is that it's not yet as good as TikTok. Um, but there was a time when Instagram stories wasn't as good as Snapchat and now I think it's better. Um, so currently Reels is very personality led, uh, taking on kind of those gimmicky video edits, which you saw that I even did. Um, it's kind of music or performance led or those kind of challenge videos that's kind of very like viral, take part in this hashtag, that sort of thing. Um, and it's very much what we're used to seeing on TikTok, literally because people just post their TikTok videos on it. Um, news some news organisations have kind of dipped their toes into using it for just short form video clips and that sort of thing. Um, I think it was the Telegraph the other day just put up um, as one of those parties in like a halls or something and they just put up a clip of that because I think they probably only had like a 10 second clip so they were like let's just try it on reels um, or they'll just use like presenters or celebrities. Um, it's going to be something that can, will continue to adapt um, so just keep an eye on it. Your kind of like students are that kind of TikTok generation so it's you guys that will be forming that um, and pushing those changes so if you have any ideas on how news organisations should be doing it then you know try it out yourself be that first journalist to really push for that to be to be happening um so i can come back to these this is we can should we stop here and do some questions yeah, I think we ought to because sure. we're getting loads um, and we may we may we, you, you may be covering some of this in some of your final slides, uh, Tash. So let me um, that's just let me just um, publish some of these uh, questions and then we'll go through I love so many. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. Um, do, 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 um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, what's the best time of day to post? I don't know. Again, if, you, if you're going to cover this later, that's fine. We'll move on. But what best time of day? Um, there probably isn't really a best time of day um, because kind of is that just stories or in general? I think that's just in general. In general, there's no real set limit. It's not really Instagram hasn't really said that, whereas Facebook has kind of said you need to post in the times that your audience are awake. Like Facebook is very much like you need to post in the times that the UK audience are awake. That's when you need it. But Instagram is very much any time works, really. Um, I would say just to fit around your day kind of as early as possible. So then it's there for when people wake up, kind of those hitting those commute times, even though obviously no one's really commuting at the moment. Um, but there's, there's still those habits there of when they look on Instagram. So it's like first thing in the morning, in the evenings. Um, so there is an area within your insights on your Instagram uh, page where you can see when people are most active and um, so our audience are more active in the evening um, which normally works well because I would normally do like three or four posts during out the day and then by that point when they're logging on in the evening they're kind of like top of their feed and they've already had a few different likes um, so they're already there for them to watch. Um, in terms of stories it doesn't really matter um, just because they're there for that set 24 hour period and if one of your audience hasn't watched it, it will be there until the end of that 24 hour period and appear new to them. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, that's not very specific. No, 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 that, that, that's that's helpful. Um, uh, here's one from um, Shinran Xu. Is it possible to do a series of stories like traditional journalists would do on a big event on Instagram? So I think we're thinking there of, you know, stories like the uh, you know, a big sporting events or, you know, like uh, like an Olympics or maybe a, a big explosion like we saw in, in, in Beirut. Um, you know, would you would you do a series, I guess, of follow up stories? How, how would how would that work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
The New York Times actually did a really good um, stories package from Beirut um, and it was because uh, obviously they've got they've got millions of staff so they had people there and it was people on the ground kind of in the rubble um, so they'd obviously so what I do with my reporters is I will just get them to shoot um, and then like WhatsApp me the footage and then I'll produce that myself and layer with kind of the text and whatever else you want to put on top of it. Um, and that's kind of what the New York Times did for that because it was very much in real time. It was very unpolished for what the New York Times is, is best known for. Um, and it was it was kind of they switched between different places and where they were. And so definitely it's what well, that's one of the really good things about stories is it can be very informal and then it can also be quite polished at the same time. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And you could also just have Olympics and things like that. You can have people reporting from the stadium like I'm sat here just waiting for I don't know any sporting people to come out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's that instant kind of reaction that you can get to it. So yeah, absolutely. OK, great. Uh, a question from Tasha. Um, in your opinion, uh, what gets the most views or likes? Text on pictures or just pictures with captions below? Um, it depends really because it also depends on what you kind of like trained your audience to want. So um, I've grown our audience by doing a mixture of both um, and have found that our pictures with text on do do better because they'll kind of hit people quicker in terms of what it's about because it's right there. Um, whereas as we as I showed you the independent the mirror, the sun, they don't put text on their pictures, but their audience is used to that. Um, so they know that they need to go to the caption to read about it um, and they're kind of big enough that they can just get away with that because they're not going to lose anyone and they didn't probably need to build up their audience much because everybody already knew who they were. Um, so it's just kind of picking what you think suits your brand or your page um, and then going from there and, and then seeing then what your audience likes. Yeah, OK, thank you. Catherine asks, uh, do you know a good free app for creating captions on video? Uh, Catherine's been using mixed captions, but it's only on iOS. Um, I don't actually. I've I've got one that I can talk about uh, briefly. I can show you it now. That's just for pictures. Um, but I actually don't have one for video. Um, no, I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, well maybe maybe someone else uh, in in the um, in the group today knows of one and can maybe chip that into the Q and A column um so while you're looking for that um let's move on to the next one cameron asks what do you think about journalism on tiktok versus instagram uh with some journalists like sufi smith galar getting very popular and going viral on tiktok pushing people to then check out her instagram twitter and articles should journalists be mastering all platforms wow lots of questions there cameron yeah, loads. Yeah, Sophie, Sophie does like a lot and I think um, it just depends what you have time for really. Kind of Sophie's definitely become one of the a personality on TikTok as well as being a journalist, um, which is kind of key to kind of mastering stories and on, on Instagram and on TikTok itself. Um, it's kind of what you're most comfortable with. Some people won't touch one and then are obsessed with another one. Um, if you're kind of across all of them and one of them one post blows up, then at least you'll then can spread people to other places. Um, it just depends. It just depends how thinly you want to spread yourself as well. So, like personally, I'm a one one woman team, um, and I've picked what I think will be the most effective for us to growing audiences and getting those click throughs. We don't have a TikTok. Uh, I don't have time to do a TikTok for us. Um, but I made that decision that I wanted to do Instagram over TikTok. Uh, we also took a little bit of a step away from Twitter um, to really push our Instagram as well. So it's just about making those deci decisions and don't feel like you need to, you don't need to put yourself out there. There are journalists that I've followed since I was at uni and I still don't even know what they look like, like just because they're just hidden behind their computer screens and all they do is write, write and never actually go in front of camera. So you actually don't have to do that. Um, which is also completely fine. <laughs> great, that's a great advice, uh, Tash. Um, here's a question. How do you uh, use Instagram to promote lifestyle journalism or do you focus on uh, purely using Instagram for promoting news stories? So for me, it's just news just because that's kind of my background and kind of what 
the eye paper is more like we obviously have lifestyle stories and and I will like share those sort of ones so we do a lot of food stories they kind of do really well for us among, among our audience so um I will share those quite a bit um but it's kind of just those same principles having strong images having those strong short sharp headlines or quotes uh personal stories um and just making it a collection of your work um that just really represents what the the message that your brand or your newspaper really want to put out there okay great um ali says sometimes the resolution of videos in stories with captions breaks down does that happen to you too and if so how do you avoid it happening yeah it's really annoying <laughs> um how do I avoid that? Um, sometimes I find it happens, sometimes I find it doesn't. I try not to overproduce them. Um, so adding more elements to them does seem to cause more of a breakdown in quality. I would say definitely do not put elements on a video within Instagram stories and then save that down and then repost that because the quality will be terrible. Always go from the strongest quality you can upload that right over the top do whatever you want then post that straight away don't don't save that down because then the quality will be compromised um i've also found that if you're putting gifs over stories over sorry if you're putting gifs over videos and stories that can also pull the resolution down as it will always uh, seem to go to the resolution of the gif rather than the video it's on which is really annoying um so yeah i tend to avoid gifs on on videos as well uh, Emily is wondering what apps you find the best to use for editing your content, mm -hmm. uh, for, for instance, for the PowerPoint and for text heavy posts. So um, let me just, can you still see my shared screen? Yeah, yeah, we're on reels there. Um, so if I just share this across, um, so I use a website called Canva. Um, I did use Photoshop, but actually like this is free um there is a canva pro but i don't use that um and actually this is probably the simplest way that i found because it it saves all of your previous designs so um a little sneak peek inside uh how we put stuff together that's actually one i didn't put up i'll delete that um <laughs> so uh what i'll do is i've i've got our um font that we use on all of our posts there um so i've got kind of a, a size range i'll use on most posts um so it's either between 58 or about 64 um with the image behind it and just decide where i want to put those how i want it to sit um it's very easy to use so there's different text options on this side it's just a very simplified photoshop um, and that's kind of what i use for most of our posts so uh, these are some of the ones that have gone up in the last few days and again if i didn't fancy that i can just move that around um, i put like boxes behind it sometimes if the text is getting lost on the on the picture um, i've then overlaid another little picture there on top of another one just to break it up a little bit um, so yeah i would recommend canva and you can post directly from Canva to Instagram? No, you save down, so you literally just click download and then so if I wanted to save that one, done, and then download that. And then that's done. And then you've got it and then that'll be in your downloads and then you can upload straight away. My next couple of slides talk a bit about how to upload. Great, thank, thank you, uh, Tash. Um, just a couple more and then we'll let you get on. Um, ooh, uh, do we need to think of ourselves as internet celebrities? Well, I'm going to I'm going to combine that one with um, with Cameron's question. Do any individual journalists at the eye have accounts that they use for their journalism? How does their use of individual accounts compare with the organizational account? So I guess those those questions are, are maybe hitting at the same thing there. Yeah, so I might actually come to those a bit later just because I do touch on that a little bit fine, fine. Um, near the end. Yes. Um, but yeah, hopefully those will be answered. And if, if they've got any questions on that, then they can. Good. Um, can uh, Catherine is uh, asking, can a small university Instagram account use swipe up or is it for only a certain size of account only? <laughs> so you have to be a business account to have the swipe up option. And I believe you have to be on a basic level, you have to have over like a few thousand followers. Um, 
that can differ. So I, I did used to think it was you had to have more than 10,000, but the iPaper account already had that functionality. Um, so I think it just varies and it might be something that you have to like kind of request from Instagram and speak to. Um, but you can always do other ways of, of sharing links. So I wanted to show that um, with on here. <clears throat> so another way that we do it is um, um, is we have a link in our bio here. So when we share a post on our page, uh, we'll say link in our bio for the story, which I'm sure you see a lot of people do. And what is it? Is it's this uh, here? And we use Linktree, which again is free. Anyone can use this, um, and it's just a place to house um, links, basically, and people can go through. And that's all of the um, links to the corresponding posts that are on there. Click that, and that takes you straight through to the website. Um, so even if you haven't got Swipe Up, you can have a little link tree in your bio. Um, and that's a really good way to see how many people are, are clicking through and stuff. And we are really seeing that kind of paying off for us as well, which is good. OK, uh, Yuki Hao asks um, the interactive elements that you've talked about before, such as uh, polls and AR, th they can all be used and finished on Instagram. Is that right? Um, so, so yeah, so polls um, is within the stickers on sorry so yeah so polls are in here so uh, when you when you're going to create stories you can just uh, swipe up and you've got these ones here and you can adapt what your poll you want your poll to be about um also questions you can ask get people to ask questions so that's all production within instagram itself okay great um is reusing IG packages, uh, i.e. video stories possible rather than creating them again for other platforms or is that not recommended? So I have tried, I did actually try this with our um, no DSS episode of um, our I explained. Let me find that. Um, and I shared that to our IGTV. We don't do IGTV just because it's not something that's like a priority. You don't really have time to do it. But um, this no DSS one, I did then share that. I packaged that up within Premiere Pro and just edited all those stories together um, and then put it up as a singular video, um, which worked quite well. We then tried that and put that out on our Twitter and our Facebook and it did perform quite well. Um, the quality isn't great. Um, which is kind of, as, as previously mentioned, does happen with stories uh, itself. So it might just be that it's something you actually create first and then put in stories. Um, but it's up to you, really. It's kind of that that kind of repurpose across all platforms. Um, you can do it in whatever order you want. It's like so I could have made this for like two and a half minute video before and then put it on stories. Um, I just have to do it the other way around. And it, it just depends what you prefer to do. Um, Leanne's got a question about uploading posts from uh, uh, from desktop, but I think you're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, Mike is asking, are all the features you mentioned available with a standard account? But I think we've we've talked about that as well, haven't we? Um, is, I, think it should be. I, I would I would just say get to know your account um, and see what you can do. Um, some newer features take a little bit more time to hit different accounts. Um, so just just see and keep an eye on what's coming and what your just what your friends have on their phones. That's a bit different. Um, it can differ between Android and iPhone as well. Uh, OK, just two final questions, Tash, and then we'll let you get on. Can this, uh, if an account doesn't have enough followers to have the swipe up feature, oh, you've, you've done that, what would you suggest to use instead? But we've we've looked at the, the links instead, haven't we? Mm -hmm. um, and then Jenny asks, uh, what's the best way to save stories for longer term access? Oh, OK. Um, so what I would say with that is put them in your highlights. So create a highlight. Um, so these are highlights here. <clears throat> that appear on your profile um, and I've got one for every episode that we've done of our I Explain series. Um, so there was one about local lockdowns, um, how COVID-19 spreading, testing um, and what it does is it saves that one. So that one I showed you earlier, the one that I did, that's from five weeks ago, but that's still there and available to view because that's in our highlights. Um, and it's just a really good way to showcase like your work and um, what you're putting out there as well. Great. 
Tash, thank you. Um, we've got another ton of questions sitting uh, in the Q&A, but I'm going to go through those now, answer some of the ones that I think I've al we've already answered, uh, but then we'll come to the others uh, at the end of the session. So do you want to, to carry on? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually just going to turn my light on because it suddenly got really dark. <laughs> One sec. OK, I can see it again now. I've got a bit of an orange glow. <laughs> Great. Um, so some of these I've covered um, and I'll whiz through to catch up. Um, so a bit about how to make posts. So some of this was covered a bit earlier. There's a this might seem a bit repetitive, but it's just because it overlaps a bit. Um, and rather than it's hard to kind of break it down and not just have you on my phone and be showing you on my phone. Um, so as I mentioned, kind of authenticity is really important. Um, and I found that using a combination of like pre-made content, so um, as I mentioned, making it in Canva um, and then layering that with Instagram elements is kind of the best way because it keeps that kind of you keep your brand, you keep your brand identity and that kind of professionalism of of those posts you've made outside of Instagram. But then it's very much still an Instagram post because you've got that Instagram recognisable text or font and um, you've got those Instagram in-app widgets as well. Um, and it's it's still making it feel like something that um, was posted by someone in your audience's friend. Like it could just be they're watching a friend's story, um, but they're actually watching a news organisation's. Um, and yeah, being overly polished isn't what Instagram is about anymore. Uh, strong images are key. Um, don't include too much text. Um, and yeah, stick to your brand. And as I mentioned at the start, I love accounts like The Telegraph where their feed looks like it could be a flat plan for their newspaper. It's very recognisable. It's very on brand. Um, so how to manage posts. So desktop, if you are using an Instagram, Instagram account that is linked to a business Facebook account, um, you can upload images via Creator Studio within Facebook on your computer. Um, so this is how I tend to manage our Instagram account um, just in terms of time management as well. Um, and it's just like posting on Facebook basically. So you upload an image, you add a caption um, and then you can either schedule or for a future time or publish it. It has made my life so much easier. Um, there is the option within Creator Studio on Facebook to make stories. I wouldn't recommend it because it's awful. Um, <laughs> and it's very much kind of, I think, for people more on Facebook to create stories rather than people who um, create on Instagram and then just happen to share to Facebook, which is what we do with our um, stories as well. So we do share them across to our Facebook page, um, but they're very much Instagram first. Um, so yeah, so that's on Creative Studio. Um, another way to manage posts is doing it from your device. So um, I've got a pixel and upload from that. Um, you can upload, I would say that's the best way to do stories, as I've said. Um, you can upload multiple images at a time. So if you're putting together a series, so this is one of our new series that we have, which is called How I Manage My Money. Um, and it talks to people and um, which speak quite honestly about their salaries and that sort of thing. So you can upload multiple images, add creative element elements to them. Um, but I would say only do three or four at a time if you are adding creative elements to them um, because Instagram can sometimes overload and then if it crashes, you lose everything. <laughs> it's very stressful. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, only do three or four at a time. Um, but the way you do that is you go into stories, you open your camera roll and as you can see here, you can tap one, two, three, four, um, and then click select and then that's how they appear and you can scroll through them at the bottom there. Um, if you are also sending yourself images uh, for feed and stories, make sure you're doing it in a way that doesn't compress the image, um, like kind of reducing the quality. So don't send by like Facebook Messenger. Um, I think WhatsApp might like WhatsApp's usually OK um, or use WeTransfer if it's a big video file as well. Um, and then also, if you're working from an Android phone, maybe get a colleague or friend to check how it looks on their iPhone and vice versa, just to make sure the formatting is all OK. Um, so, yeah, so my posting top tips are consistency and volume. Uh, use the tools at your disposal. Um, using all aspects of the platform is one of the things that's going to get your page featured on Discovered. Um, and therefore that's going to get you more followers and reach more audiences. So kind of Instagram said this themselves that 
the way to read to get on that discover page is that you're posting on your feed you're posting on your stories you're doing igtv you're doing like all of the things in the recipe and then that's how you get on the discover page whether that's strictly true i don't know but it's worth kind of giving everything a go just so you've kind of got a presence on all of those um and also repurpose existing content and be inspired by the content created by your colleagues. Like if somebody's worked on like an incredible investigation and you think, oh, that's really not going to hit on Facebook or it's really not going to like, no one's really going to worry about that. Like make them care about it, do it, publish it in a compelling way using Instagram and reach people that maybe wouldn't have even thought it was interesting in the first place. Um, and then also, yeah, use widgets to engage with your audience, doing polls, voting, and um, even liking comments as well on, on posts. Um, but yeah, don't spam them, as that says there. Uh, so building an audience, I realise I probably need to whiz through these, but so you've also got within a business account on Instagram, you've got insights, which appears uh, here on your settings. Um, I can't show you my own insights because uh, I'd get in trouble um, but you are able to see um, who your audience are um, and kind of what they're doing and their behaviour within your your page so um, audience first strategies are talked a lot about within social media and newsrooms and a lot of the time people are just like I don't know what that means um, basically identify your audience who are they currently who's watching your stories who's clicking on your posts who's liking them and and is that the audience that you want as followers uh, for your brand or for yourself? Is that who you want? If it's not, then maybe you need to be posting different content to attract those people and vice versa. Um, so Insights offers a follower breakdown by location, age, gender and their most active time. So somebody asked a question about when people are most active. It varies, but it will be those kind of like evenings sitting on, a, on the sofa, scrolling through, tapping through stories um, or first, first time in the morning when they wake up as well. Um, so yeah, so post about the topics your audience are interested in um, and then combine this with posts um, on kind of lesser topics, but ones that actually still resonate with your brand. So the iPaper is very kind of like politics focused. A lot of our audience are politically minded, um, but a lot of the time the politics posts that we put up aren't like likeable stories, <laughs> but they're still important. So actually we'll put something up that's an important kind of a political piece, um, but actually it's not something that you'd like and I am, I'm actually not that disheartened when it doesn't get that many likes on it and um, but it's still important that we're reporting on that and we're mirroring what's going out on our website what's going in the newspaper um, and that's still kind of important to the brand and not necessarily what our audience wants to physically like I'm sure if there was a hate button they would hate it um, <laughs> so there would be that interaction if they could um, there's also interactions and reach data in the insights to see which posts have over and underperformed. Um, you can break this down by week or year. Again, if you've got access to these, just have a little scroll through, see what they look like. I unfortunately can't show you mine. Um, oh, I don't know why that's done that. I'm going to skip that one because it's broken. Um, but that was going to be a bit about uh, getting the right audience. So um, you could literally post pictures of cats and dogs all day if you wanted to. Um, but they probably you'd then just have an audience of just people who love cats and dogs. Like one of our top posts is a kitten. Um, it's like a Scottish wildcat kitten. And I knew it would do well. I thought it was cute. I happen to like cats as well. Um, and it was one of the reasons why I posted it. But also that kind of cutesy posts we do put up but we don't that's not what we constantly put up as I said politics and news that's very much our brand it's just sometimes nice to have that bit of fun and it also creates engagement with your followers we had a lot of comments on that post um but I'm not going to do that all the time I'm not going to turn it into a Scottish wildcats appreciation page that's not what I'm about um and I think it's very easy to fall into that trap if you want if you're going for kind of those like cheaper followers um and it's that it's the ease of it, but kind of really working at getting that right audience does take time, um, but it is worth the effort in the long run. Uh, making your account a user habit. So I've spoken a little bit about this um, on stories. So getting people used to tapping through. So you want building a habit amongst your audience and having kind of recurring content um, or topics. It br breeds familiarity and loyalty. Um, this is actually called appointment viewing. I think it's in digital marketing that they call it appointment viewing. It's a bit digital marketing. -y. Um, 
and you actually might even do it yourself without realising. So if you listen to that podcast that comes out every Thursday, reading that piece from your favourite columnist every Saturday, that's you making time to engage with that content. Um, and that's something that you can do as a journalist on social media. Um, so while I was at Metro, our lifestyle team launched a new series called What I Rent. Um, it looked at people's rental properties in London and we posted about it every Wednesday. We had a Facebook slot specific for it and we made sure that our Instagram stories went up every single Wednesday at lunchtime too. Um, after quite a few weeks, we began to see more people tapping through to the story. So it was the stories was a breakdown um, about that person's flat, where they lived, how much they paid, just a couple of slides with a, a swipe up at the end. Um, and we began to see more people clicking through, more people swiping up. Um, and it's still going now. So that's from that's a post from 58 weeks ago. Um, and the design is obviously kind of pre-made, but then with other Instagram elements layered over the top. Um, and here's the one that went out today. So it's very it's it's got a bit more polished even in the time since I've not been there. Um, but that's I'm sure that's probably getting thousands of click throughs now, which is amazing. And, it, and it's still going. It's a recognisable um, uh, series that people will come back to and look out for now. News gathering. OK, so that's kind of the main basics really about posting. I just wanted to touch a little bit on news gathering itself. Um, as you are journalists and you can also it's not all about kind of um, posting for other people you can also it can also help you find um, things for pieces you're writing. So sourcing news content uh, like Twitter and Facebook Instagram offers a place to find news um, and it's often overlooked in breaking news situations which I've actually found uh, personally so um, while covering the fire at Notre Dame in 2019 some of the kind of first images and video we sourced uh, for metro.co.uk were from Instagram um, and that was kind of from my lead. I was kind of leading the news desk um, and it's it's one of those places where it's so iconic. There's going to be people already there taking so many pictures. It's probably one of the most photographed places on the planet um, and it's like, well, why don't we look on Instagram? It's like the picture place and so to source these videos and images, um, I think we even had a live video as well that we were we got permission uh, from the person to use. Um, we searched locations uh, for post tags in that area, also kind of adapted that. So um, somebody was searching just the Notre Dame Cathedral and I was like, no, you need to like it's it's in France. You need to look for it in French. It's under a French tag. So always think of that if you're looking for location tags. It might be under the local language. Um, use use hashtags that make sense so Notre Dame fire not fire at Notre Dame you want something short sharp snappy which other people are probably going to be jumping on um, especially if they're speaking different languages as well um, so other ones we looked at were like Notre Dame Notre Dame fire Paris fire Far fire Notre Dame um, if it's a reoccurring news story or you're looking for updates you can then follow one of those hashtags and then those will appear on your feed um, you can also, if you wanted um, on other stories, you can uh, create a Finster account uh, for sourcing news, um, which it could be just be following all news accounts um, or play or accounts in a specific location where you're covering a story on. Um, and it also may be a more professional way to approach people than doing it via your personal account. Um, so verification is also important that I think you've probably you'll probably end up having another whole lecture on <laughs> um, and I know I could do a whole a whole another three hours on it probably um, and I think everyone could learn from this even journalists that are working freshly at the moment um, so when you have found the content to be used in a story it is really important to verify that it is accurate and contemporaneous information is it actually posts about that specific event ha did it actually happen today or is it actually just a repost that's jumped on that hashtag and they want to sp spread kind of that disinformation um, basics really check the date and time of the post always check the profile of the person who posted um, take the time to trust nothing, especially when covering breaking or developing news. Second guess everything. Um, watch out for copycat images, uh, e.g. pictures from one natural disaster kind of attributed to another. Um, this is also the case with um, group pictures of missing people. People love to make those and drop in like fake people within them. So be very quick um, to judge those 
especially from your personal accounts, don't just blindly retweet. I say this to journalists in my newsroom all the time. Do not just retweet somebody off of your feed. Click on their profile. If you don't know who they are, if they, not even if they don't have a blue tick, you can't even trust blue ticks at the moment. But if you're on Twitter, don't just retweet them, check them because you never know who's actually got Tommy, Tommy, Tommy in their bio. Um, crowd shots as well. Be wary of those. Make sure it is actually from that event. Um, and use common sense. Does it look real? Ask someone else to have a look. There was pictures from a fl from floods in like Texas or somewhere, I think, and it was like a shark swimming up the street. And it was that's quite clearly not going to happen. Um, other tricks include reverse image search um, and video searches. You can also look at the image method data checks. Um, this is another link that I'll send round as well. That's the Reuters guide that's really good um, and just breaks it down for you. And it's just a good one to have bookmarked and um, just so you can look through. Um, and final one on this, so requesting user generated content. Um, so you found what you're looking for. You think it's it's you verified it to the best of your ability. It's real. It's the best you can find. You think it's really going to bolster your piece that's going up on the Internet. And um, as soon as possible, your news editor is screaming at you. Um, so this is what, what do you do then? So if you do get in touch, be mindful of their situation. Check they're OK. Never ask the person to take risks on your behalf. Um, People, journalists are quick to jump on poor form in user generated content requests. So other journalists will try and rat you out for just being like, give me that photo. Uh, just be human about it. Um, so here's one I did to myself. Uh, so just literally something like, hi Tash, I hope you're OK and safe. Could the iPaper use this video with credit to you? It would appear on our website and social channels. I've also sent you a direct message. Take care. Just be human about it. Um, I was a news reporter at the Evening Standard and I was covering the uh, terror attack in Barcelona. I ended up being on the phone to a guy who was hiding in a shop and he'd taken a couple of pictures and he was going to send them over to me. Um, and then he said, oh, well, I can just go up to the window and get a couple more pictures. And I was just like, absolutely not. That is no, that's never OK. And putting somebody else at risk is never OK, like even for the biggest story in the world. Um, you just need to do your job and that's not getting putting other people in harm's way at all ever. Um, if you take it to a private channel, uh, follow each other, chat it over there. Um, if it's images or video, ask them explicitly if they took it themselves, where they, when they took it, where they were um, and ask to use with credit for use on like all your platforms just in case. It might just be going on Twitter, it might just be going on your website, but it's best to ask for all permissions just so they don't come after you later. Um, and always take screenshots of any permission given. So last one. Um, so this touches on kind of building your own personal page. So I'm hoping that um, uh, some of the stuff I covered earlier when managing main accounts can kind of be transferable across your own stories and feed posts and things like that. Um, but this is kind of a basic look at what you can do for your personal page, personal professional page. Um, so some examples here, we've got um, Porna, who's one of our columnists at the iPaper, um, and she's shared just a screenshot really of, of a piece that she's had in Vogue India, which is really cool. Um, then actually her caption about that is quite personal and she's just saying how proud she is to feature in that and how happy she was and, and a bit of the like behind the scenes stuff, which is quite nice. Um, and we've got Vicky, who I showed earlier in one of our I Explained episodes, who's our housing correspondent, um, and she will share kind of a screenshot of the of just a mobile um, news article every week. Um, our, on news websites, the mobile websites are user friendly. That's what they're built for. So actually just sharing a screenshot of a mobile news article um, actually doesn't look that out of place on an Instagram feed and it's a really good way to just show what you've done. Usually it's just the start of it. So if you want people to go through and read it, you can say link in my bio and the people can go and click on it, which is great. Um, what I'd also say as well, if you've got a specific patch, so um, that girl who asked, I think it was a lady or girl asked about lifestyle. Um, so if that's what you focus on, then make your personal page about that as well. So um, Jess Gross here is the parenting editor, the New York Times, I think. So all of her, most of her content on her personal professional page 
is about parenting. She's really owning that kind of topic on there. Um, and then Polly here, who works for um, STV News, um, she's like a celebrity interviewer and that sort of thing. And she's done this nice kind of one of her with the guy from Succession, um, Brian Cox. Um, and yeah, so don't just like, um, talk about your work, show it, show it in the articles, show it in uh, an active picture of you interviewing someone like that's always interesting and it's always fun to share. Um, and always bring it back to storytelling. You are a storyteller, you're a journalist, um, so you can apply the tools and strategy from that I've said from managing main accounts to your own professional presence on Instagram, know your niche, if you have a focus or a patch, own it on your personal profile as well. Um, don't just share pieces you have written, adapt and repurpose them for your Instagram profile and Instagram audience. So if you wanted to break that down further in your stories, if maybe you knew that your friends aren't going to click through to that link and you just wanted to screenshot each section of it and put that in your stories, then you can do that as well. Um, just a way to get it out there. I really love Alex Beard, who is at the wife of Riley. So she is a kind of former news presenter, now turned mummy blogger. Um, and she uses the stories format to give uh, daily headlines and a breakdown of complex complex issues um, such as Brexit. She was a TV news reporter, so she's really like affable on camera. She's really likable um, and she's, she's just really good at breaking it down. And actually she's reaching an audience that maybe wouldn't normally stick around and listen to that sort of thing. So she's very like family and mummy bloggery. Um, but then in the next post, she's explaining Brexit or um, the coronavirus restrictions. So it's a really good way to like be across two topics at once um, and she does it really well um, and that's just her kind of repurposing and then adapting that for her audience. Um, but I would say consider having a professional Instagram separate from your private personal Instagram. Um, when you're applying for jobs uh, your prospective bosses will probably look at your public social profiles. I know I have done it um, especially if you're applying for social jobs, so your social media hiring editor will be able to find everything that you leave public. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit before and maybe think about having a Finster account. So the a Finster is a fake Instagram account um, and they're quite common amongst younger people. But instead of using it to spy on like people you don't like or people you fancy, um, why not use it in a way to follow specific accounts for sourcing news um, instead of having that on your personal feed and then actually your personal feed can literally just be your friends and family and that's all you need to worry about. You could use it to follow, um, you could have an MP finster so you followed all M UK MPs on Instagram and um, so you could just had a feed of that. Uh, local councils and I think these are very boring examples but you never know who's going to slip up and post a nude or a screenshot of a text. Um, so yeah thanks for watching, uh, go create great con content on Instagram and also follow the iPaper. Wow uh, <laughs> Tash thank you so much so you you really powered through so much there in the last uh, 20 minutes so thank you for doing that and uh, those of us who uh, have presented before online, um, whether it's in this format or, or on Zoom or whatever. We know how tiring and exhausting it can be to talk for that length of time. Uh, and you've done it in a very engaging uh, way. So thank you for doing that. Now, will you hang around for 10 or 15 minutes just yes, while we yeah, no do, do some more questions? Yeah, nowhere to be. <laughs> Sorry, say again? Nowhere to be. Yeah, nowhere to be. <laughs> OK, so. Um, Blah, 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 blah. I think we've covered some of this uh, already. Let me just scroll back to the um, uh, any any online resources to learn more about hashtags. Um, not really off the top of my head. I would just say um, have a little look at what other people are doing. Whether it's uh, depends what you're um, posting about, really. If it's a specific topic, then have a look at certain accounts that cover that topic and how they're using hashtags. Um, if not, just kind of keep an eye out for it, really. They're the sort of things that you'll see on your feed every day, but you actually won't pay attention to. Um, but if you just actually start looking and seeing what people do, um, I would just say it is kind of less is more, really. Use those kind of more hard hitting um, uh, hashtags that have got larger audiences than doing a thousand of ones that only have like three posts on them. OK, thank you. We've got a couple of questions from photojournalists. Um, 
the first one, does Natasha have any tips for a photojournalist who wants to use Instagram to give exposure uh, to their own work? Any particular uh, suggestions for photojournalists? Um, I think just share, share your best pieces, absolutely jump on those hashtags, those location tags, um, follow local uh, picture, um, like local destination picture pages. So uh, as I mentioned before, at Metro, we have the hashtag Metro London um, hashtag that we use and a lot of our of the audience on that account are photographers and lifestyle journalists and travel journalists. Um, and actually, it's a really good uh, community to join one of those and then kind of share content within those. So I know they do that on a local area. So it even just like hashtag visit Newcastle, hashtag Newcastle photographers, that sort of thing. Just have a little look and see what's out there. Um, and also dependent on where your pictures are taken as well. Like you can just use them on that. So it could be from the angle of where your photo is taken. So jump on the sharing in that location or just the fact that you're a like a northeast photographer and that sort of thing. So, yeah, just try and find a community around it um, and jump on that for sure. And I just wonder, I mean, you mentioned about uh, you, you mentioned someone who sort of gave a little behind the scenes uh, glimpse with um, with what they were uh, writing about in the in the text with the photograph. Is that something photographers could perhaps photo journalists could perhaps do, you know, not not just the photo itself, but actually give a little bit of a, a, a glimpse of how the photograph was taken, what the context was? Would, would that be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Like, as I mentioned, um, the kind of it's very stuff is very front facing now and that but that doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to stick yourself in front of a camera it could just be that in the comments underneath the picture you're breaking down where where you were when you took this what the thinking behind it was or even just the stories of how you made this picture so oh i posted this picture last week it got 10,000 likes here's actually how i created that that's a very big trend on TikTok is the kind of behind the scenes look and how I made this. Mm -hmm. um, one of my former colleagues um, who's a video journalist, he is quite big on TikTok now and he so he does street style and his TikToks are literally just him recording him doing the street style in London. So going and taking pictures of people um, and it's just kind of that ex you're experiencing it with them um, and that seems to do quite well. So yeah, that was definitely that behind the scenes take works really effectively. Uh, and then Eva Marie says, hi Natasha, can I use my account to also share my personal life? I'm a photojournalist, but I'm also a mother and I love sharing my daily life as well as my work. Uh, is there a place for mixing it up like that? Yeah, of course. I definitely think there is. It's just it's more the kind of like um, you don't want your boss seeing you getting drunk in Ibiza. Like you can have a nice shot of you in Ibiza, but maybe not the one of you passed out after a night out. It's that kind of having that line, like it, it's what you would maybe show somebody at the pub after work, that's completely fine. And I think having that personality often is really good to have there. It's just um, personal preference on what you want to put up. Um, and if that fits into what you're writing about, what you're taking pictures of, then absolutely you can do that. OK, uh, Mike is saying that on his news Instagram account, about 100 or so followers dropped off as the account was approaching 5000 followers. Any ideas why that might be? Um, no, it sometimes does happen. There's sometimes a big drop off. Um, Instagram is still very much a mystery to me in, in some aspects like Facebook. Um, I've been working with Facebook like on and off now for like five years and I'm still baffled by them at most times. Um, so there doesn't really seem to be a magic recipe. Like I'm really sorry that that happened, but it might just be that they were like not real accounts and they were actually all deactivated at the same time. Um, but I would say just keep persisting because it is once you hit those milestones, um, like we've really seen a big snowball effect of when, once we hit that 10K on the iPapers account, it's really started to pick up and we're, we're gaining followers quicker than we ever have. So it is just keep going for those kind of milestones within your follower accounts. Uh, Lucy uh, has just put in a suggestion. Lucy likes you cut on Android for adding caption to videos. So um, that, that's something for uh, the Android users among us. Um, Marco was asked about verification, but you, you, you covered that. Uh, and actually, Marco, um, if you look in our 
YouTube channel. Um, we had a fact-checking masterclass a few months ago with uh, Joe Leary uh, from Full Fact. So um, I'd recommend you, you have a look at that because um, uh, Joe went into some depth about uh, images and, and verifying images in that. Um, Myra, Myra has been asking, are, are there any key points to, to growing fans? Now, I know you spent some time um, looking at uh, at that just a moment ago. Um, Tash, uh, I think Myra, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong here, Myra, but I think Myra is maybe looking for maybe some quick fixes. You know, she's saying here in a follow-up question, um, you know, if you release some controversial Instagrams uh, to make you quickly grow your fans, uh, it, could you do could you do that all the time, or maybe what what's the I guess what's the risk of doing that kind of thing? Um, I think it's just kind of there's no quick fixes really. It's just kind of being again, it's that consistency and volume. So I'm really just sticking to the message and your brand and what you you want your audience to be interested in, what you know they're interested in. Maybe on a separate platform like the people that read our newspaper, but then kind of engaging with that younger audience. I think it's just being consistent. Um, I think that's kind of if you're going for those like kind of cheaper likes and that's it's not something that you can depend on um, and they won't be consistent um, in their returns. It's better kind of going um playing the kind of long game, I think, definitely. Um, do you use an app for publishing the same post to in Instagram, Twitter and Facebook or, or do you customise them all? Um, so I tend to customise them all really just to kind of adapt across. Um, I do use social flow um, though in my kind of like daily scheduling across like Twitter and Facebook and I do find that really helpful and um, that is paid. Um, I think the connectivity between Instagram and Facebook now is so much better so you can just post from um, Instagram stories straight to your Facebook stories um, and then also any post you do on Instagram you can post straight to um, Facebook. Um, if you go in settings you can do linked accounts so if you go settings accounts linked accounts um, and then you can see wh where you're connected to and then you should get an option to share those posts when you're posting so um, yeah there's not really a blanket one for all of them. Um, but it, and it's probably better to slightly adapt it for each platform. Sure. Um, Yuki Hao again, uh, does Instagram give certification in the same way as YouTube or TikTok does for active citizen journalists to protect their authority and credibility? So I guess a little, is there a blue tick? There is, you can get verified on Instagram. It is a bit of a mystery to me how that happens because I know it does tend to suddenly appear. Um, but I think it's possibly the same sort of thing as like Twitter and like YouTube has said, it is something that maybe you can apply for um, and that just through consistency of work and content, they can recognise you as that kind of as that kind of person that's out there um, and doing those things. So I would just say keep it up. And I would also say as well, like don't, put too much stock in blue ticks um they're kind of less important now than they were say like five years ago um it's kind of like anyone can get a blue tick now um and actually it's it's about the content you put out there um and I think that's kind of why I said as well like don't just retweet or share from people that have got blue ticks because that doesn't necessarily mean that they're um kind of verified or are putting out kind of supportive information uh, Sarah wants to know if you use um, any kind of storyboarding techniques. Um, so with I explained I so I write a script for that. So normally it's um, kind of a combination of a few different features or articles that we're putting into one thing. Um, I will then just use a Google Doc really um, and just kind of go slide one, slide two, slide three. What's going to be said in that? Um, then having to script that down to something that can be said within 15 seconds um, or around 30 because it now clips up as well. Um, and then just going from there and then I'll read through that with whoever's presenting it or if it's me, it's fine. Um, and then just laying it out. It's it's what works for you, really. I'm I tend to I can kind of see what I want in my head, so I don't actually need to put it down. I just know that I'll get there eventually. Um, but I think kind of Google Docs or even just um, 
when I worked at Metro and I had the luxury of not having to create posts myself, I could just send them to the picture desk. Um, I used to draw it <laughs> and just get a walk over to the picture desk and be like, I want this, please. <laughs> and then just hand them a bit of paper and they'd be like, oh, OK, I think I understand that. Um, so I think that's possibly the only luxury of, of being a one person team at the moment is I know what I want in my own brain. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think just laying out as much as you can and just being as descriptive as you can, if that's going to a different team and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, Jenny just um, wanted to point out that it's worth noting that Insights is only available to business accounts, um, which is yeah, um, fair, fair enough, uh, Jenny. Um, Leanne says, um, in engaging your audience, do you community manage, i.e. reply to comments, respond to complaints as well? And what is what is the eye's voice when you do that? Um, so we probably don't do that as much as I used to, just again, because it's literally just me or the late editor or the weekend editor. Um, and once you start properly community managing, you you can't stop. You've kind of committed to that and it, your responses kind of need to be the same to everybody, um, even if that is no responses, if that makes sense. Um, so I'll like comments on Instagram. Um, I probably won't reply to them. I will delete ones that are like abusive or offensive um, or kind of spammy, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah that's that's it really it's kind of on a minor level for us um we do uh, we do have a um a comment site department that mainly deal with newspaper things and we also have it set up so any uh long messages we get through facebook they go directly to our comments inbox um so that kind of goes straight to the people that deal with that um but it tends to kind of be kind of a free platform really for comments unless it's like um very offensive mm -hmm. OK, well, just um, a final couple of questions which um, are more about um, working as a social media editor, um, really, Tash. Sure. Um, so Georgina says, what would you say are the biggest challenges within your role as social media editor? Um, I know due to current changes to Instagram's algorithm, a lot of users are struggling to gain exposure their posts are underperforming. Have you found this to be an issue and how would you combat this? Um, so the first question, uh, my biggest challenge is time and that I don't have enough of it <laughs> <laughs> and I need probably about three days worth of hours in one day to get everything done that I want to get done. Um, also kind of having to do eight different roles in one so uh, being a social producer, scheduling posts, um, also then editing posts and uh, being in charge of social headlines for the site, uh, being a graphic designer and making Instagram posts. Um, it's quite, it's very, it's, it's the sort of role I never thought I'd be lucky to have because I'm very much um, enjoy doing a lot of different things but then with that comes the challenge of having to do all of those things in a set amount of time um, so yeah that's probably the biggest challenges I face but I do I wouldn't change it I do really enjoy it um, in terms of Instagram like algorithms change all the time it, it's just having to kind of keep up with them I know actually it was kind of there's been a hit on um, smaller kind of like my friend's got like a doggy page uh, for her puppy that her lockdown puppy um, and I know that she was hit as well um, and we've not actually been hit that badly we had a bit of a struggle last week actually um, but it's not hit us too badly touch wood um, so it's just kind of adapting to it and it normally will level out like um, Facebook algorithms they'll muck you over for a couple of weeks and then they'll be your best mate again and then it's it's like having a, a troublesome child really at times. <laughs> <laughs> I guess as you say uh, Tash you know really uh, you know maybe it's about prioritizing and it's about focusing on the content and maybe I mean I say this not as a social media editor so what, what do I know but maybe not focusing too much on the numbers and the algorithms. I guess that I think is I suppose that's what you're measured on as a social media editor isn't it? 
Yeah, so it, it's still kind of dependent on those referrals, which is, is why is it, it's important that you are kind of always referring back to those pieces and, and stories and content that your colleagues are creating, because that is what you're measured on is those referrals back to the website or those people going out and buying the paper. Um, so that it is it is important to get those in and that is the main goal really. Um, but it is also you need to factor in kind of what you can do in the time that you have. Um, and what you enjoy doing as well, like as I said, we prioritised Instagram over TikTok or anything else like that, um, just because it's kind of my favourite thing and I've got experience in doing it. Um, and actually it is, trends are showing that we're moving away a bit from, from TikTok, from not TikTok, from Twitter as well. So kind of dialed that back in again, but that's still our second highest referrer for social platforms. So it's still a big deal for us. Um, so yeah, it's just about prioritising and, and then not being yourself up really if, if you just don't get to do as much as you want to do. Sure. And, and then finally, um, when applying for a social media role, would it matter if you don't have your own personal Instagram account? Uh, because this, this it's anonymous, but this person is saying that I have experience working in social media for small brands, but I've recently deleted my personal account and I'm wondering if that would work against me. No, good on you. I'd be like, well done. You're a stronger person than me. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I would just say if that comes up, then back it up, give reasons why. I think people who work in social media know how toxic it can be. I now don't go on Twitter at the weekends. Like, absolutely. If I see my boyfriend on it or he's like, I've sent you something really funny. I'm like, I'm not looking at that. It's the weekend. And um, so I think it is really important to set those boundaries. Um, I think if you back that up with the management you've done on other platforms, if you've got the experience, that's all that matters, really. Um, and you've got the option there of having like a finster if you needed just to work one to just follow people make a little finster and just have it for that if they insist um yeah no i i don't i wouldn't hold it against anyone and i also i actually quite find it quite entertaining i interviewed someone a couple of years ago and i couldn't find them on instagram no matter how hard i tried and then i interviewed them and i was like what's your handle on instagram and they said it and i was like oh i didn't find that i'm so impressed <laughs> <laughs> so make it hard for us and sorry, Tash, just one final question has come in, which is probably a good one to, to end on. Where do you think that Instagram will be in 10 years time? I mean, will will Instagram in 10 years time be the all conquering social media platform for, for journalism and news? Or will we be have moved on long ago on to something else, do you think? I think if it stays on the same trajectory, so it's been around for 10 years. I think if it stays on the same trajectory, trajectory sorry can't speak i've been talking for too long the words don't work um i i think it will be the replacement for facebook i think it's been very good at kind of absorbing the good things from other platforms um i think there's a lot to be said for how facebook conducts itself i'm really sorry facebook if they're listening into this call please don't judge me um but that might eventually come back to bite facebook in the bum and it might just be that then that's a Facebook wide shut down. Oh, look, Instagram. How amazing is that? And it might just be a shift over or, or they merge into one like they share so many features now. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they merged into one kind of mega platform at some point um, and without anyone even noticing. Um, so, yeah, so I think there's a, a lot to come. Definitely. I just think because of their ability to just take other people's ideas and, and then make them better. <laughs>